But for now, uh, I wanted to move on to this evening's event, uh, which is going to be Vicky Now, uh, Brandon Shimoda, Selena Su, and a special discussion uh, moderated by Dorothy Wang. So, um, and I'll be introducing each of the poets in turn. Um, so, Vicky Now was born in Long Khan, Vietnam. She is the author most recently of Umbilical Hospital and of the short story collection, A Brief Alphabet of Torture, which won FC2's Ronald Sukunik Innovative Fiction Prize in 2016. Uh, the novel Fish in Exile, Coffee House Press 2016, and the poetry collection, The Old Philosopher, which won the Night Boat Books, Night Boat Books Prize for Poetry in 2014. She holds an MFA in fiction from Brown University, where she received the John Hawks and Feldman Prizes in Fiction and the Kim Ark and R. Stark Memorial Award in Poetry. Um, Ray Armentrout has said about her work, imagine an entity composed of sheep, wheat, assholes, clitorises, stars. Why not? That would be this poem, this world, a perfect, I, I'm not doing my Ray imitation. That would be this poem, this world, a perfectly recognizable post-human world, which is also post-surreal. Vicky now is making it new. No, she is doing the old job of making us see what's already here in a new way. Thank you. Wow, it's really bright up here. Okay, um, thank you everyone for coming. And um, thank you Monica for the wonderful introduction. I'm just gonna go straight in and I'll just read um, a little bit from each of my book. So I'll start with the umbilical hospital. Make your unknown known by walking away. Make your unknown known by walking away. Two moons sit side by side like owl's eyes, not glancing, not looking, not blinking, just staring. Courage and wisdom, these are essential wheat, daily bread of air and time. You advise the moon owl, if you stare enough, a pastoral feel, will you nate a lake like marriage made inside a concubine's hairdo? going to read um, one uh, story from um, A Brief Alphabet of Torture. Sorry, I scared myself. <laughs> so this one is called Suicide Bomber, and it's from um, A Brief Alphabet of Torture. Rowing a tiny boat, I thought I could reach the hem of the horizon. Rowing under it would not be a dream come true. Rowing along the side of the hem is not cream, not nightmare, not October. When it loses its breath to a stem dying on its own pithy soil. What is it like to see oil when you're rowing your boat, where the sun matters most as it spills God's miscarriage or adultery? You skin your rug because it has become, it has come from an animal fainting, fainting animal and your, you skin your ironing board because you have made a mistake. You burn your fabric. You burn your table while you row your tiny boat. And the oil on the surface of the sea gazes at you as if you were the breeze that has lost its ardor to row. When you reach the hem of the horizon, it is not what you think it is, not your mother cease, ceasing swaying, it is your father, undeflated, blowing backwards into his lungs, a helium balloon, which you mistake for the evaporating sky, the opposite of a sunrise. When you rise in the morning, you are full again. The content of your soul is not made entirely of stroping sunlight stroked by an ashtray. The content of your soul is made entirely of detergent and snow which spill over the fire escape because you live in an apartment complex inside of a timer's body, which tells you when to live, when to die, when to row your boat, and when to explode. And 
And then I'm going to read a poem called Bird Poem. I tried to uh, select all these based on the body and migration theme. Bird Poem. I tell you the stars are moving lightly and the birds are flapping in flight. They float aimlessly in the ether, winter in their heart, summer in their thyroid glance, spring in the liver, fall in their left temple. You stir stones in a pod made of iron. You stir the seeds of civilization in light and in water. Love is light, you say. For lunch, we eat pebbles. The small stones fall down our esophagus and sink down the ravine of our stomach. Butterflies on our chest. Life outside of the thyroid glance. The birds are strung to the pebbles down near our diaphragm, like light weights glued to a balloon. We are sore from living life and from making love a day and night. What kind of love is this when it can be broken in segments inside of our diaphragm, ready to burst into ravenous flight on its way out of our mouth? And then I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, Fish in Exile. It's always hard to read from a novel, um, especially this novel that uses um, different kind of um, formatting and different genre. So I was mixing nonfiction, fiction, playwriting, poetry, all of those into one fluid genre, and it's really difficult to read. But I think I'm able to pull something that is, is approachable verbally. Um, I've come to see my son and daughter-in-law in a snowdrift. A week ago, there was a blizzard. Both ends of the spectrum, England and New England, are covered in snow. When I got off the airplane and lay my heels in the snow, my son must have thought I was a bird gliding through a snow globe. My son. I glance at my son, at his handsome face. Such a beautiful man, my mammillary glance once nourished. I breastfed him daily, spoon-fed him my nipples, and now just look at him, milky and white. Look at his handsome form, hatless, long blue coat, the bluest I've ever seen in years. When he opened his arms, he would be opening the sky. And inside the sky must be a heart that whispered sadness like the sound of turtling vellum. The little ones, the ones who didn't survive, the one who mistook the sea foam for their mother's white cinder dress. When beauty is halted, what must one do with one's air and one extensive untenanted, untenanted future? He lifts my luggage into the bed truck. I stand very still and let the snow breeze through me. My translucent scarf tosses in the wind like vapor. He opens the truck door for me. I stand stiller. This airport is so small. Each step I take feels like crushing cardboard marshmallows. And then I'm going to read um, one passage from Sheet Machine, which is coming out in June of this year, and it's out from Black Sun Lit. We begin to see the neck of the sheep to the left more clearly, a Mabel-like in design. The sheep waxes the grass with quiet intent, as if to say, one day the snow will grow a beer, yellow and, f and gold, fruits of demon and Lucifer paradise of den. And slow, so slow, the sheep whisper into the grass, you are so wild. The grass replies, even on the hills my roots are trapped in the earth, wild, so wild. But I'm a balloon held down by the rock, the sheep adds, do you know that I read Bigupati Singh and Nietzsche? The grass replies, I wish I could smoke some weed while you read to me. 
I really wish, man, I really do wish I could smoke some weed. The sheep responds, I have a high tolerance for cocaine. I just do. I just do. You're just going to have to take my word for it. I just do. And I guess that ends that. Uh, next, uh, we have Brandon Shimoda. Uh, Brandon Shimoda was born in L.A. His most recent books are Evening Oracle from Letter Machine Editions, which received the 2016 William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America. Its sequel, The Desert, uh, forthcoming this year from The Song Cave, and his first book of nonfiction, an ancestral memoir called The Grave on the Wall, forthcoming next year from City Lights. He is currently researching and writing about the ongoing legacy and ruins of Japanese-American incarceration. He lives in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, the, um, the Huffington Post has said about Shimoda that uh, Shimoda's lines are by turn gracefully aphoristic and effortlessly metonymic. They transcend their subject, the author himself, by dint of their intelligence, sensitivity, and spiritual awareness. It is not too much to say that Shimoda is writing somehow, impossibly, the universal autobiography of a nation. <laughs> Katie here. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm also really nervous, uh, afraid, um, but especially grateful. So in maybe September, October 2016, I gave myself this assignment that I would only write about Japanese American incarceration for one year. Um, so I did that, and then I couldn't stop, and I still can't stop. So I'm going to read some paragraphs about Japanese-American incarceration. The first thing I heard about the train ride from the detention centers where Japanese immigrants and Japanese-Americans were corralled in horse stalls for six months to the concentration camps where they would spend the next three and a half years of their lives was that they were instructed to pull down the shades. They did not want us to see where we were. They did not want us to see where we were going. Even if they could see where they were going, they would not have known where that was. They were being ferried beyond forgetting into bleached outer space and were becoming under the watchful yet dispassionate eyes of America Migrants, unwitting, non-consensual migrants, whose destination was not a place, but a condition. Not only did they not know where they were going, they did not know how long it would take to get there. And not only did they not know how long it would take to get there, they did not know how long they were going to stay. They were being separated from one reality and forced into another. Because it is psychotic not to know where you are, in a national space, Banu Kapil writes in her book, Schizophrene. There was instead mother's face and grandmother's face, father's face and grandfather's face. The shades pulled down the windows were family portraits through which each family member slipped into the darkness of America after life. Shortly, you will not see a mountain you will not see on the face of the mountain the shadow of a gargantuan spider. You will not see the shadow of the gargantuan spider rushing down the face of the mountain. A man named Ichiro Shimoda tried to bite off his tongue. He was being transferred by train from California to a prison in Montana. What use is my tongue if I am not permitted to speak? At the first sign of blood, they materialized like wolves and dragged him onto the floor. Why were they so adamant about keeping Shimoda's tongue in his head when they were so adamant about Shimoda not using it? Here is a story that was told to me by the young girl who appears in it. Don't get too close to the ditches, the older boys said. If you do, snapping turtles will grab you and pull you in. 
It was the young girl's first day in the desert, her first hour. She had just gotten off the train. She was six. The train vanished, but the black shade still hung in the dry desert air. The desert was flat, except for a few hills that looked like they were hiding something. Over the next three and a half years, the young girl would grow familiar with and knowledgeable about and even in love with the desert. She was there because she was put there by her country, the United States, which looked at her or did not look at her and determined that she was their enemy, which meant also because she was an American that she was her own enemy. But what did that mean? What are snapping turtles? What happens when they grab you and pull you in? She thought of hundreds, thousands of snapping turtles waiting at the bottoms of ditches with yellow eyes like squash and green eyes like zucchini. That is how you become a snapping turtle, she thought. That is how you stop being human and become a snapping turtle. But how do you become an enemy? Maybe love is the feeling of being familiar with and knowledgeable about a person or place with whom you are forced to be in relation indefinitely. The young girl looked at the desert, the hills that looked like they were hiding something, then at the barbed wire, and looming above it the guard tower, on which was standing a potato-faced man, whose face was partly obscured by the gun that was aimed at her face. On April 24, 1943, Eleanor Roosevelt visited the concentration camp where the young girl of the snapping turtles was incarcerated, Gila River, on the Gila River Reservation, Arizona. Eleanor Roosevelt looked out at the 13,348 Japanese Americans and whispered to the white man beside her, I would try very hard not to have too many of them in the same place. The white man was Dylan Meyer. Dylan Meyer was the director of the War Relocation Authority and also the commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Then Eleanor Roosevelt raised a glass of milk to her lips, took a sip, and pronounced the milk sour. White Arizonans were complaining that the Japanese were being coddled, that they were being given special milk. Eleanor Roosevelt's sour milk was meant to quell their rage, as if the milk curdled beneath Eleanor Roosevelt's tongue into a ghost, a thirsty ghost. It is obvious, Eleanor Roosevelt said, that people who are friendly aliens have to suffer in order to ensure the vital interests of this country while at war. But, as Sora Han reminds us, the United States is not at war, the United States is war. We used to dig holes beneath the barracks to stay cool, the young girl of the snapping turtles said. We cut holes in the floor and built sunken rooms. Thoughts of being forced underground into hiding and digging one's own grave came to mind, as did snapping turtles at the bottoms of ditches. The young girl of the snapping turtles is now 82. Her name is Yoshiko. I stood with Yoshiko in a reconstructed barracks in a museum in San Jose. She was my tour guide. Is this what it felt like? I asked. This is what it felt like, she said. Then she said, this is what it feels like, which I took to mean that seven decades later she had not left, and also that living in a concentration camp felt like being part of an exhibition. On Sundays, the people of Portland, Los Angeles, rural Arkansas, etc., drove out to the barbed wire fences to watch. The fence that separated the white tourists from the Japanese Americans formalized the border between them. In truth, it paled in comparison to the fence white America had constructed, was always constructing to protect itself from the haunting auroras of its hateful, diseased imagination. The United States referred to the concentration camps as pioneer communities and to the Japanese Americans as pioneers. You are the new pioneers, said Ralph Merritt, director of Manzanar, to a group of Sansei high school students. Pioneer from the French pionnier, meaning foot soldier, from the Latin pedo, meaning pawn. Here is a scene from Jean Wakatsuki Houston's book, Farewell to Manzanar. Her mother is being forced to sell the family china, worth at least $200. 
The secondhand dealers, Houston writes, are like wolves. One of them offers $15. Mama, enraged, smashes a plate at his paws. Those are valuable dishes, the wolf howls. It is only after he is deprived of what he intended to steal that he reckons they are valuable. Mama smashes another plate, then another, never moving, never opening her mouth, until the wolf scuttles like a cockroach out the door. The scene ends with Mama smashing the entire set of family china until the floor becomes a ruin of blue and white fragments. Here is a scene from the movie Come See the Paradise. The Kawamuras are given six days to evacuate their home. The three youngest siblings are going through the family's record collection. A record is playing. A Japanese man is singing. What are, go what are we going to do with these old records, they asked. They're all Japanese. No one's going to buy them. Lily, the oldest, says without hesitation, break them. Lily is played by Tamlin Tomita, whose father Shiro was incarcerated in Manzanar, the same camp to which her fictitious family is sent. Break them, they asked. Break them, she says. The siblings smash the records on the floor. The room becomes a ruin of black fragments. Only the Japanese man singing remains. Lily lifts the record off the player and breaks it. Ichiro Shimoda, who tried to bite off his tongue, was transferred from Montana to a prison in Oklahoma. An FBI memo, memo refers to Shimoda as insane. He died in the custody of the military police. Little is known about his death, although everyone knows he was murdered. My grandfather, Midori Shimoda, knew Ichiro. They were incarcerated together in Montana. Not that my grandfather told me about it. He did not tell me anything. He took my hand and walked with me into the fog. He must have thought somebody was listening. He was born 108 years ago this week. I dedicate this to him, to Ichiro, and to Yoshiko, the girl of the snapping turtles. Thank you. And Last we have uh, Selena Sue, uh, who was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and lives in Brooklyn. Her first book of poetry, Landia, was published by Belladonna in 2018. Her writing includes two poetry chapbooks, three books on the politics of, politics of social policy and civil society, and pieces in journals such as N Plus One, Harper's, and Boston Review. Uh, she is the Marilyn J. Gittell Chair in Urban Studies and Associate Professor of Political Science at the City University of New York. And her work seeks to engage critical bottom-up perspectives across geographical locales and disciplinary lines. Um, says Dorothy Wang, in her impressive debut collection, Selena Sue extends the possibilities of the poetic, bringing as much careful attention and firsthand experience to the concrete details of what she calls prosaic subjection as she does to the syntax and moods of poetic language. In this particular political moment, the poems in Landia feel especially urgent. Landia brings together the freedom of the poetic imagination and the realities of state and corporate power, forcing us to rethink the borders of the literary and of the political. Thank you. Thank you so much to Asian American Writers Workshop, to Monica, Dorothy, Brandon. I'm really excited to be here, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to read just a few poems from this book, Landia. And the first one, I'm just going to read an ex a couple of excerpts from a longer poem called Seeing Like a State that draws upon different stories of migration, um, a little bit of my families, but also those of um, neighbors in Chinatown who I did oral histories with. And also um, touching upon not just real life family stories, but the discursive tropes and popular debates around immigration to which we're subject. Each time the Q or B or R train rattles by on the Manhattan Bridge, I close my windows to keep out the noise and dense black dust. The earth shattered in 1906. The sky roared ablaze. Our forefathers were paper sons, their birth certificates buried alive or burned in City Hall. They stepped forward, for each of our foremothers gave birth to 800 children. We were thus American. 
We attended clan hall meetings filled with strangers and everything but names, strangers in, names, in name only, who don't talk about. I want to get to know my neighbors in Chinatown, especially the ones who grew up here. I want to know what this neighborhood was like before I arrived. I want to, while ignoring those who ask where we are really from, to walk beside my neighbors down these streets, to be neighborly. In the 1950s, Mao Zedong claimed that American imperialism was a paper tiger, outwardly fierce but unable to withstand the wind and the rain. Nikita Khrushchev replied that the paper tiger has nuclear teeth. In the 1960s, George Plimpton came back from Paris as, as a glowing paper lion, winking breezy hijinks, all the while an agent of influence at the CIA. In these knots and teens, self-labeled paper tigers pay $1,400 each to learn how to romance blonde women. As if papers were these wispy, gossamer nothings, tickets to role-playing games, as if others could humor our pearl-white perils when paperness demarcated our entire. My father's documents misstate his birthplace, his birth country, my mother's her birth date. Our realities become apocryphal. Truly, there were no tiger mothers then, nor tiger fathers, nor paper tigers unless you conflated our pronouns. My neighbors tell me stories of when they worked in the local sweatshops with their mothers, when they darted between and even swung from clothing racks. They hid from investigators coming by to make sure that there were no child workers in the folds of other people's disposable incomes, at the bottoms of buckets and barrels, out on the fire escape. Safety in cardboard, safety in numbers. After Pearl Harbor, Warren Magnuson repealed exclusion, welcomed exactly 105 China people a year. A travel ban that coagulated us, smushed us together under a gavel. As if we toiled in a zero-sum game, sharing nothing but a hundred names, cooking up massacred laundry. In 1964, my father set off for Brazil by cargo ship taking three months to travel from L.A. to Panama to Curaçao to Sao Paulo. By the time he arrived, the military had seized the government in a coup. To pay respect is not to come close to knowing. I long to pronounce the names of film directors in the same dialect, at least, to engage in a conversation in which we could nod acknowledgement to each other's respective circumstances to know the signs to look for, to go beyond signs, migration patterns, bird calls, food habits, and tastes in film. I can't sit still nor stand upright in the humidity. In lieu of asking where each of us came from, to have a sense of where each of us is coming from, even if we might. The arbitrary have precise consequences for those who remain labeled neither horse nor tiger. So the phrase that I ended um, that excerpt with uh, sort of refers to a phrase in Mandarin, mama, hu hu, horse, horse, tiger, tiger, which is, I don't know the etymology of it, um, neither here nor there, um, but I have affection for those who who defy categorization and for the media, what, what can be sometimes called the mediocre. So something that's horse, horse, tiger, tiger is meh, it's not great. Um, and a lot of these phrases are compound phrases like mas o menos, com si, com sa. It's sort of funny that in Thai, there's a different set of animals, snake, snake, fish, fish, nu, nu, blah, blah, even though I'm not pronouncing that well. Um, but my, one of my favorite phrases that indicates this manness um, but it's not compound, it's also from Thai. It's my pen saparot, it's not pineapple. Because pineapples are the epitome of fucking awesome. Um, so this next poem at the bus shelter sort of re um, refers to some of those phrases. We are neither here nor there. We are horse, horse, tiger, tiger. We are snake, snake, fish, fish. We are more or less. We're like this, like that. We are so-so. We are not pineapple, nor the apples of anyone. 
Our eyes are not windows, and our souls are not bread. Our hands wave royally. This is no sleight of hand. Because I am left-handed, gauche but not sinister, the still damp ink of each word I write smears as my hand skims the paper to write the next word. More than fingerprints, the printer's mark of the side of my hand is signature. More than joy or anguish, except perhaps hunger or ennui or saudade, that we are living as if we are not quite alive. We are marginalia. We lie between the lines, the fine print of our social contracts. Our votes are not cast, but one day our children will be special electorates. We hear that they'll go to a special college. We are soaring American. We are standing united. We are going transcontinental. Between points A and B, we pray to the oracle of Delta. Um, I'm going to read a poem that I first wrote in response to the Asian American Writers Workshop's um, call for responses to Trump's travel ban, and it's about JFK Airport. I am delayed, I am canceled, I have a license, I have a passport, the picture is mine, I come in good faith. She is my bona fide, blood filial, my only, I have no other names. Here is the stamp, I have this hologram, I have a destination. I speak some Spanish because the signature is mine, I have a sense of direction, I have a purpose. I was born there because I have a spleen to vent, I'm willing myself to remember the physical sensation called homecoming, called homesickness. I am an assemblage of maybes. I must run to the gate. Please let me through. I will become. I have an appointment to keep. Here on the eastern tip of the Brooklyn-Queens border, even after each new court injunction against 45's travel ban, the guards operate as if we lurk in but not of America. Supermodernity is under constant renovation. My inalienable right to refuse police access to my phone has dissipated into the dry airport air. This is a port of entry to the possibilities of free trade zones, superior political zones. I brace myself for extra questioning each time I re-enter the US. Just now, I almost write return home instead of re-enter the US, but a slight ache below my diaphragm stops me. Fear shoots a prickly pain down my legs. One day, it'll knock me to the floor, pleading ignorance or exhaustion or... I first arrived on a Pan Am flight. I thought of it as liberatory, a fugitive glimpse of a utopian city world where I could discard rules and scripts my scraping by. As if I could get unsituated, this airport a bubble hovering in a void between celestial bodies in but not of the country I stand in. Now, I pass through the metal detector, the gender verification machine with a blast of air. I do not request the special pat-down alternative. I walk to the left on the moving sidewalks. I allow the compressed air to stick to the back of my throat relishing that for once, I'm not supposed to do anything but arrive early, occupy space time. I think of other airports, note what is missing here. The choice between sitting and squatting, hundreds of paintings of prints by local high school students lining the corridors, signs pointing to the direction in which Mecca lies, a square jewel box of a room in the middle of the terminal, all glass walls filled with cigarette smoke, three smokers inside, careful to avoid each other's eyes, not knowing where to look without the comfort of opaque walls. Thank you.
Uh, so we're going to have a discussion among our three writers that is going to be moderated by Dorothy Wang. Uh, Dorothy Wang's monograph, Thinking Its Presence, Form, Race, and Subjectivity in Contemporary Asian American Poetry uh, from Stanford University Press received the Association for Asian American Studies Award for Best Book of Literary Criticism in 2016 and was chosen by Ben Lerner for the New Yorker's list of the books we loved in 2016. It also garnered honorable mention in the Poetry Foundation's first Pegasus Award for Criticism in 2014. The first national conference on race and creative writing was named after her book and is held biannually. The third conference was held last fall at the University of Arizona Poetry Center. Uh, Wang also conceived of and co-founded the Race and Poetry and Poetics in the UK uh, Research Initiative. Um, which will hold its second conference in October at Cambridge University. Uh, she has also published on Asian Australian writing during academic year 2017 to 2018. Uh, she is an ACLS Frederick Burkhart Residential Fellow at the CUNY Graduate Center, working with poet scholar Emilio Alcalé and Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative. In spring 2019, she will be a visiting professor at Lingnan University in Hong Kong. And I just wanted to put in a personal pitch for those of you who have not read Dorothy's book. Um, I think it just, you know, it came to a lot of us and it just became kind of the central book for Asian American poetics uh, in, contemporary, um, in contemporary writing. I mean, she is not one to give um, easy answers, but she gives us the essential questions that structure a poetics and a history. And so I'm very looking much looking forward to her questions and her moderation this evening. Thank you, Monica. It's so nice to see Monica again, to see, I have to say a word about Selena first, but very nice to learn about v, Vicky V and um, Brandon's work. Um, so 20 years ago, I had my first job out of grad, grad, graduate school at Wesleyan University. And in my very first year there, there was a very talented undergraduate in my experimental minority poetry class, and her name was Selena Sue. So it was, it's absolutely thrilling to be here for the launch of her impressive book of poetry. And she's done so many other things besides, too, not just poetry. So, um, okay, I'm going to start because the topic here today is the body and migration. So I wanted to start by asking you guys about the Asian American body. So we are at the Asian American Writers Workshop. And wh how you think of that as a poet, as an embodied person writing the Asian American body, both um, the Asian American subject yourself or others, and the poetic speaker in your poems. Um, do you, are you thinking consciously of that I or that speaker as being Asian American or is it much more abstract or quote unquote universal, which I don't believe in, but you guys can tell me what you think. Um, so I'm just curious about the Asian American body and especially in this particular uh, moment in, of time in American history in which I think discourses around the black body are very visible. but. Um, discourses around the Asian American body continue to be sort of in the margins, as Selena said in her poem. So, any responses? I can't tell whether, okay, I did not mute this. Um, um, well, one thing that was interesting to me in listening to everyone's readings was the polyvocality in the pieces that you included different stories, you included different forms of playwriting, fiction, nonfiction, and I and the pieces that I read actually incorporated some oral histories of my neighbors. And so there's something to a resistance to simplified flattened tropes because I think that Asian Americans especially can be the model minority, can be the tiger mom, can be the, in, in ways that reify white supremacy and racial hierarchies. And so even just having this polyvocality is to resist that a little bit. Um, but at the same time, of course, we're all grounded in our experiences and we all have these different positions and they're in no way universal. But th that's my first thought. Hearing that. Um, 
I think my nonfiction address, my nonfiction and my um, poems that are, are haven't been born into the world. I mean, they're born already, but they haven't been received by um, uh, by the community yet. Um, and I think those work are going to be more um, Asian oriented or or Vietnamese oriented. I when I started writing, I didn't. I didn't really consider um, um, the, the ethnicity of my writing um, because I thought all my characters sort of are ethnic-less. Um, and I kept on writing experimental writing, which embodies um, no, ethic, uh, no, no ethnics, but have some ethics, maybe. Um, <laughs> They're really wild and out there. So my experimental writing, um, I do feel that my writing is very Vietnamese and therefore very Asian. Um, often I've been told that my writing, why don't you write ethnic? You know, your work is so um, weird, but, you know. <laughs> and I'm like... I'm telling them, well, I think the reason why English looks weird is it's because it's Vietnamese or it's, 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 it has that undercurrent, that undertone of my um, cultural upbringing of having lived in Vietnam for 10 years, of having been um, um, a refugees in, like, um, in Philippines and in Malaysia. So all of these ethnic experiences, I couldn't use, I couldn't, I couldn't use the traditional narrative structures or the, po the traditional <laughs> poetic form to express these really um, fluid boundaries that I kept on transition. And language was like a vessel for me to be able to migrate uh, different um, um, different parts of my I, uh, of of my uh, my past and of my linguistic past as well. Um, I. I I spoke Vietnamese for a majority of my um my child in my childhood, but I also like Latin was my second language. I I was taught Latin before I was taught English, so to me like um, I think if 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 anything made me my work more um, more experimental or out there or not ethnic enough is because of I think Latin messed me up. You know, it didn't have the article the in there, and so every time I had to remove it from my language. When you remove a particular word consistently across time, it shape it reshapes your identity. It reshapes the identity of your 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 poetic form, and it reshapes the identity of your poetic structure. So, as I shift and and move from um, and now that I'm writing more traditional, or at least I, what I think is traditional nonfiction. Um, people still think it's weird, but whatever. <laughs> um, and I think it's more Asian. But, I mean, and I think the reason I'm quoting, un quoting and unquoting it Asian because it has like the word Jiebamo in it, <laughs> which is like, you know, it's like a Vietnamese dessert, but Everyone knows about that, so that doesn't make you Asian, you know, but or make my, my writing more Asian. Does that answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, oh, sorry, it's really loud. Um, I, the first thing that came to my head, which is not, I don't think this really answers the question, but when I first started writing poetry. Well, so I used to have this experience when I was younger, and occasionally it'll happen maybe twice a year, where I feel like I am in my sister's body. So, and I've, I've talked to her about this, and she hasn't had the reciprocal experience, but <laughs> it's, it's like I'm in her body, and I'm, yeah, I don't know how else to explain it, and I'm looking out, and I can see that I have a brother that is me in this body. Um, there was something about the the coincidence of that with me starting to write poetry. Um, there was this place that I would go, and I called it my sister. Um, and in a way, when I was younger, I mean, we're biracial, 
father's Japanese American, mother's white. I could only really recognize my sister. She was more Asian than I was for whatever reason. And I think it was because I was looking at somebody else. So it was, it was like I had to project something onto my sister in order to see something that I didn't recognize in myself. So I, I connect that also with the, the space that I, that I enter when I write. Um, again, projecting onto some, some other body. Um, I have been thinking a lot recently about my great, my great grandmothers. And they were both picture brides. And I've been imagining the kinds of constraints, the ways in which their, their bodies were not allowed to be consummated as sovereign bodies. And I feel like that, that, um, that constraint or lack of consummation went somewhere. It became this like unconscious force that is starting to reemerge in my thinking about my family. I don't know where that's going or what that means, but I, I've been thinking about them as physical beings entering into the United States and what was not permitted of them and the ways they had to comport themselves and um, how I'm a citizen who doesn't, for the most part, have to think about those things so that in a way I want to kind of redeem that um, or redeem them. And I'm, th these, are, these are new thoughts. I'm not really sure how to do that. Hello? Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess yeah, a related question would be the positions that you guys have as, as writers in the poetry or the literary world, right? Because there are certain expectations, obviously, around ethnicity or around experimentation. So what you were saying, V, about I'm now writing more traditionally and it feels more ethnic, I think that has been the traditional rubric of expecting like that ethnic writers write autobiographically or write explicitly about, say, Asian American history. But actually, we know that, you know, that one can write experimentally and still be, have, be ethnic or be like Asian American, right? So I think that those things are blurring <laughs> now. But I'm curious because it seems like in the last few years, in the poetry world, there have been a lot of upheavals around issues of race and around um, questioning the whiteness of the avant-garde, obviously. And I'm curious for you all now as young writers at this particular moment in 2018, um, there, are, there are all these ways in which one is aware in the literary world, not only in society, that there's a particular market positioning or a certain ways in which critics will read your work. Not that, I know people don't want to think about that, but I'm just curious about, frankly, about white liberalism. <laughs> I mean, I'll just be blunt. I mean, you know, like how do white, li you know, because white liberals are the ones who are like, wow, diversity, right? Asian American, right? Like, great. Like, we'll have our one on the panel. We'll have our one at the conference. You know, we'll have like three black people, but one Asian American, maybe one Latino. So I'm curious because that's such, to me, as an academic, there's that pressure. But for writers, there's that pressure. I mean, there's no question about it, right? So I'm just going to ask you guys, like, have, how do you think about it? I mean, I mean, things are so weird now, or maybe not so weird. They're actually a continuation in the political sphere with Trump. It's just much more explicit. It's not actually new. It's just more explicit. Um, but with that going on in the background and also, I guess, all the upheavals in the poetry world, the literary world. I don't know. This is probably an impossible question to answer, but I'm just curious how people, how you all feel as Asian American writers in that mix. Well, um, I tell people that I'm Jewish from time to time. <laughs> um, that helps a lot, you know, like, they're like, oh, really? Are you, you really Jewish? And I said, maybe. <laughs> 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 and I think that sort of helped them because, like, I'm, I, I'm Vietnamese, but most people think I'm, like, Thai or Chinese or Korean, anything but Vietnamese. <laughs> and so, you know, like to sometimes like to take that conversation away from like really isolating me and completely like um, um, twister twiz picking my ethnicity to like one corner, like a really nice culinary dish, like those, um, um, I shift it completely and I just say something that it's not me, you know, like I'm not Jewish. But um, but I I I can identify with a broader um, brushstroke of like how people um, address like ethnic problems. 
I'm not sure if I remember your question um, entirely. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to figure out which one, which streams, uh, to the critic or the, the. <laughs> uh, do you want me to focus more on the critic? Uh, either way, it's fine. Yeah. Or I can just blab on yeah, about. Um, <laughs> um, well, maybe Brandon or Selena. Yeah. No, no, I wanted her to blab on. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Brandon. No, no, I was no. I'm, um, I mean, I mean, critics not gonna approach me and ask about my Jewishness. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna have to take this question seriously. Um, <laughs> um, I grew up watching. I'm, I must admit, I grew up watching a lot of white, white folks films, films like that are very avant-garde or French very French, um, like, uh, um, what, what is that French filmmaker that, Breathless, what is that? Godard. Yeah, yes, Godard. I ended up watching Godard, and I thought, wow, he spoke in a language that I could understand. And I didn't realize much later how white he was or how French he was. And so I, was really, I became concerned, I think, for me, because of, and, and then later concerned for my entire whole, like, um, continent, you know, like Asia. And so um, and you don't know that, especially if you live in Iowa for 20 years and then you are Vietnamese and you speak Vietnamese at home and you watch Godard and then you read a bunch of white people's writing. So if, you, if that's your landscape, like corn, cow, Godard, um, <laughs> um, I think it's just natural that, you know, you wouldn't be aware of your Asia-ness or that you are a refugee you just suddenly landed here. And so for me, like if critics were to like criticize about my non, uh, my experimentalism and my, my, my whiteness in my, write, my, my Asian writing, I think they just have to like, they just have to like chill out, you know? <laughs> you know? And, um, and I think it, it will come in time. Like I listen to a lot of Vietnamese music, you know, and no one knows about that. No one, everyone asked me, oh, would you give me a music selection? I said, I don't know anything about white people music. I really don't know about jazz. I don't know anything about, um, uh, um, uh, I mean, jazz is not really white people, but you get the idea. Um, and, um, and, you know, they all have this recommendation of list, and I just tell them all these Vietnamese music that they could not relate to me. And it's usually music about war, like Vietnamese war music that I love. I just... I felt really close to, like, there's a Vietnamese song called Ya Tu Vu Ki, and it's like goodbye atomic bomb or something like that. And it's, or Vu Ki, I don't, I don't know, I'm not translating that word correctly, but it's like goodbye bomb or something. And it's just very beautiful and very ethnic. And I feel like when I write in English, that's the song that pl is playing in the back track of my head. And then to say that, you know, like my writing isn't ethnic enough, it's just really heartbreaking because I don't think they can understand that, you know, when, if, when, when a plant, you know, like blooms and you see its greenness, but you don't know that it has lived its life in a particular kind of root. You just see its greenness and then you criticize for its greenness, but you don't know what kind of water or the kind of uh, soil it has, you know, emerged in or had deeply um, germinated in. And so I think, I think there should be a broader broad stroke on how we should criticize um, Asian American writers and critics that criticize us for our whiteness. Sorry, Brandon I, or Selena, you guys want to say anything? <laughs> I was just thinking about implicit in your question, both the author, but also specific audiences and, and how we shape one another and how it's really difficult for me to think through because I'm not sure that's the audience I have in mind, but every once in a while I get a reaction so that I'm like, oh, like the, the, the 
first poem I read from the scene, like a state one, is probably the one with the most overt autobiographical details, but most of the poems aren't quite like that. But there have been folks, and I don't know if they're representative, et cetera, who have been white and come to me and say, like, this poem must be so important to you. And so, and then I realized the extent to which that poem was fulfilling some expectation, white liberal expectation of family genealogies or something happening there that in a very specific way. And so I, the way in which perhaps I write as an Asian American or an immigrant is not through content, but through my obsession with slippage of language. And, and it was a real joy to get to work on this book because I was asked to think about the visual architectures a lot more and think about negative space and the size and shape of the book a lot more. And um, part of the book has a running footnote through the whole section, and I've been told that it feels like information overload sometimes, but in some ways, it's because it's because so many of us are treated as moving targets that I that I might as well act that way and refuse to be pinned down so that there are multiple narratives there. These questions are really good. I just want to listen. Um, I wrote a book that had absolutely nothing to do with um, my experience as a Japanese American at all. It was a book of poetry that had, it was probably the book of poetry that I wrote that had the least to do with anything related to Asian American experience. And somebody reviewed it and only talked about Japanese American history, which I found really, and it was written, the review was written by an Asian American poet. So I thought maybe I, maybe I'm, I'm certainly not the best reader of my own writing. Maybe even though I said that, something is coming through that is very um, clear to somebody else. But I always think about that. Um, I, I mean, certain things are inescapable, I guess. I could be writing about something completely unrelated to anything and people will have their interpretation of it. I don't, I don't, yeah, again, I don't, I guess I don't really know how aware I am of those things as the writer. Um, but I think, I think some people, they're much more, well, and, and including my own family members are much more satisfied when I write things that are autobiographical because they can recognize themselves and that could touch upon the Japanese American experience or not. But um, because a lot of what I write is maybe inscrutable, uh, certainly to my grandmother, for example, who can't enjoy it. Um, so there are sometimes that when I want to write something that my grandmother, who is very old, can enjoy, and those things are going to be autobiographical and and they're going to be about her, they're going to be about my grandfather. But. but it's interesting because actually the pieces that you each of you read had something to do in some way with displacement that's been affected by U.S. policy, whether abroad or domestically. So then in a sense, this sort of Asian American poems or these Asian American narratives are actually American narratives, right? And I know what Selena remarked upon, the sort of trajectory, the multiple trajectories of the multiple... Um, strands here that all of us, in fact, when I think, look at all, including Monica, myself, and the three of you, that the different diasporic trajectories our families have taken, right? I grew up in the South. Monica grew up in the South, too. So the, they're not the predictable ones, necessarily. You were born in Brazil, Selena. Um, and it's so interesting that when you, when you, I think most Americans forget that first Asian American history, they don't even know it half the time, right? But that history of incarceration, that history of the Vietnam War, the history of all these like displacements in Southeast Asia where people now are now having to immigrate and, and, the, and the trauma that's still, you know, has its consequences today, that's the American story and it continues right now because our policies are still doing that, right? Um, and I think people do forget that the United States in the last century had, 
went to war with four different Asian countries, starting with the Philippines, you know, the Philippines, Japan, Korea, Vietnam. And now we're about to maybe do something with North Korea, right? So um, that is our history. So th I think that's also something that to think about. So American poetry, what is that when we presume that like that experimental poetry or that mainstream American poetry is white and that everything else is just an accessory to that. That's actually obviously problematic. I mean, that's what my whole book is about. But mm -hmm. anyway, I'm gonna, open the, I'm gonna open up the questions to the audience so we can have more of a conversation. So do people have um, questions for the three writers? <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Alan. Um, I, this is a general question. Um, kind of speaking to this idea that um, uh, critics tend to read Asian American writer work as auto autobiographical or something inherent related to Asian American a Asian Americana. How do you, how do, how does how does that kind of challenge your work, or how do you kind of subvert that in a way going forward, or and what challenges do you see in subverting that kind of tendency to read to read your work that way? Um, I can answer that. Um, I I want to embrace it. I I'm, I'm ready to embrace more um, traditional non-experimental form of writing about my Asian background. Um, I think um, having been um, through a very dangerous refugee um, experience, I think part of my childhood, I think all of us, especially, I think, I, I, I can't speak in general, but I like to speak it in general, because then if they disagree with me, they can always approach me and say, that's not my story, and they say, great. But for the generality of it, I will say that many of us who experience um, migrational or refugee um, traumas, I think we experience some sort of um, um, emotional, psychological, or even ethnic um, autism. It's a form of like a coping mechanism of kind of abandoning completely our past, uh, the psychology of our past, and just adopting something completely neutral like experimental writing. I think experimental writing is very neutral, it's safe, even though it's experimental and it's a groundbreaking in its form, but in terms of an emotionality of it, I think it is safer. And so as writers, we kind of wanted to go there because it helped cope with the tremendosity of being an immigrant, of being, of, you know, seeing, um, you know, pirates raping, you know, your siblings, or even, you know, uh, father's hands blown off by three bullets, you know. It just, you, some aspect of our human experience requires that separation. And I'm happy to say that experimental writing was, um, a part of that journey for me. It gives, it gives me freedom to explore language. And then when I was able to grasp hold of it, it gives me the mastery to sort of move forward by writing something more traditional, more mainstream. And I think that art is really difficult. I think mainstream writing is even more difficult than something that is very natural for me, which is experimental. It's like I tried to write Fish in Exile as a Harlequin romance, and it looked at what happened to it. <laughs> you know, it's not a Harlequin romance by any means if you heard the excerpt. Um, and so, you know, I said, uh, this is gonna be the bestseller. You know, it's about two couples, about a couple who lost the twins, you know, grieving. It's the same as Harlequin romance. And, and, and in my mind, you know, it was so clear, but it wasn't, you know, after I finished writing it, my sister wouldn't even finish the first page of it. I realized, oh, this is not the Harlequin that she was seeking. And so I think, you know, it's uh, post experimental literature is an important journey for all writers, whether where we're coming from, what ethnic we are. I think it's just necessary for us to bridge that gap before tackling something that I think broader. I think like it gave me the freedom to, to, to know, well, what should I put on the page now that I'm 
more aware, more conscious, more um, um, that my voice can be um, be mainstream now. What kind of audience can I can I reach, and what what do I want to really say? You know, it makes me more more conscious. It makes me more conscientious, and it makes me uh, thought more thoughtful about what I put on a page, and not just what will any reader want to read. And I think that specific, that kind of delicate um, attention to 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 uh, to a broader to writing something for a broader audience or to the masses is it's beautiful. I think that I'm I'm glad that I was an experimental writer before I. W I'm being born into more some, something that everyone would want to read and experience together with me. Mm. And so, I, yeah. I, I, I think I actually agree. I, I didn't think I would agree. This idea, well, I don't write to the masses. But um, I've, been, I've been writing much more kind of straightforward prose. I used, I, I mean, not that I used to, but I still write poetry, um, but I've been writing a lot more straightforward prose that I think, I think is, is, is like a test of accountability. I think that, because um, I have a lot of questions and I have a lot of um, things that I'm confused by in thinking about the history of this country and thinking about white supremacy. And they're, they're, they're questions that are forming and I feel like, um, I'm not really able to answer those questions in certain kinds of poetry. I need to actually like break a muscle in my brain in order to arrive at a real thought about these things because I want to actually arrive at a thought um, because I'm frustrated and angry and um, poetry has become this other reserve where I can go to escape that, uh, that kind of more intensive thinking and I think that the idea of writing to the masses, I mean, to, to me, the masses might be 20 people who engage with an essay that I write very seriously. Um, that means that I feel like I have a greater responsibility to get something right, um, whether it's dealing with certain historical information or with, with the thinking that's involved. So, I, I, yeah, I, I like what you're saying. Well, I think it's interesting that one of the most common responses is to read autobiographically when they might not think so for other mainstream right other writers, and it's just like, how self-centered do you think I am? Um, as if we don't have other outside interests or engage with the world. And I guess it's interesting to me how you talk about experimental writing as a sort of emotional distancing in a way, um, it, what you called autism. And for me, it's, it's not exactly emotional grappling, but it is a reflexive project where um, some of the poems in the book, for instance, use cartography and mapping as a subject to think through documentation as intervention and think through these questions of the audience and how they're projecting or shaping um, the territory or the author. Um, and, and it's not just us poets that feel this way. I've talked to dream, a dreamer activists who have said to me that they are tired of being the poster children of a campaign that falls, that um, ends up falling into tropes of deservingness in ways that criminalize their parents, and and they're trying to tell more complicated stories, but but they keep being pinned down in specific ways, so that so that experimental writing is this refusal to engage in those ways, even if and then, but then. I also agree with you that sometimes it does feel like the only way to try to talk about something when trying to talk about it in a straightforward way either sounds cliched or feels like it can be co-opted or captured really easily or just feels 
like reliving a trauma. And so, yeah, all those things. Another question? Hi, uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, to bring it back to the idea of the body, I was just curious what practices you have around being in your own bodies and what knowledge is gleaned from that and what are the limits of the body? That's not too, I don't know, okay. I was going to say that, so I live in Tucson, which is a, it's a s small city, but it's in the desert, and you don't have to go very far to be in the desert. And being here in New York with seemingly billions of people everywhere you go, I'm so much more aware of the space that I'm taking up here. I mean, I guess that's a, that's a statement that is a question to people who actually live here. Because I feel like I've spent the last three days just bumping into people. Whereas in, in Tucson, I wander down very wide streets and don't encounter anybody. So my body, in a way, evaporates. But here I'm reminded that I am taking up space. So, I, I mean, I can't ask the question. I'm wondering how people navigate that. It seems very complicated. Um, I, I've been conscious about my body because um, I've, for a decade, I had um, um, allergies to milk and dairy, so I couldn't I couldn't eat um, I, ice cream. I love ice cream. For a decade, I, I didn't have ice cream. It's hard to imagine that, but it's true. Um, and so my body has gone through an evolution. It's now it's rejecting all bread. So now I can't have bread because each time I eat bread, my <laughs> face would like blow up, literally. You know, it's not just like people like, oh, you don't, you know, like it's a figurative. But I use, I use language very carefully. And <laughs> when I say my face blew up, it blew up. And so, um, but I... Um, to address, like for the longest time, I didn't care about what my body, how it behaves in the world at all. I just ate. I thought eating was just something that you need calorie to in order to write or to function in the world. I didn't think of the reverse. And so as soon as I was able to eat ice cream again, my taste buds kind of like um, became hyperbolic. <laughs> I mean, it got excited on everything. And I ate and I you know, I gain weight, and so it be, that gaining weight just surprised me, um, and 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 it made me realize that in the past, because I wasn't conscious about my own body, I had delegated to like fruits and vegetables, you know, like um, like grapefruits or um, cantaloupes or coconuts. So for a while, even though I've never personally experienced this, but I wrote a poem called "An Avocado Is Having an Abortion." And I think that was very interesting, you know, to, you know, uh, to for an avocado to experience that because often people approach me and say, well, you know, did you, you know, is, is, it, is it like a personalized version of you? And I would say, no, I think I, I'm imagining an avocado having an abortion. Um, or, oh, God, your babies are so delicious, you know, like for the longest time I thought babies were very delicious. I couldn't have them, though. Um, and so, um, literally, like, they're so delicious. And so that's one of the titles of my books, you know. I'm just like, why don't you just name your, your book, you know. Oh, God, your babies are so delicious. And so, um, you know, so my relationship to my body has sort of changed across time. And um, they can't, um, right now, I'm just very uncomfortable in my body. I'm just, I'm just so uncomfortable. I don't know if it's because I'm 38 or I don't know, I'm about to go through menopause. I don't know what is going on with my body. 
but I was like, what? Oh, okay. Thank God. <laughs> Is it a decade? <laughs> Well, I, my body has gone through evolutions in the past prompted more by, by psychic turns or, or crises. So I went from last person picked in gym class to running half marathons on a whim to not doing that. Um, and, and so a lot of it is about body and context. And it's interesting that you were saying that you feel like you've spent three days bumping into people because I feel so self-conscious, especially in other places with different body protocols of, of it, where it's less uncouth to t touch someone on the butt than on the head because the head is more sacred. Or So, so I become really self-conscious about how graceless I am in those contexts rather than here where I know how to navigate the city and so I feel okay here. And yeah, the body has limits. Yeah, I, sorry, I was, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'm just also think, talking about how I haven't talked publicly about how I'm hopefully going to give birth in a few months. So my body has lots of limits <laughs> right now. I'm a peeing machine. I, I'm not used to something so primordial. I'm used to thinking about things. I'm not used to my endocrine system governing my emotions and other processes so uh, in such basic fundamental ways and and that is something I haven't gone near in my writing so it is a really powerful interesting question of like we talk about all these other fundamental truths but we don't necessarily talk about yeah. these aspects that are are so difficult to contest so maybe one more question I think somebody had their hand up here yeah Did somebody have their hand? yeah Um, sorry, now I'm just like totally thinking about bodies, but um, I wanted to ask just a clarifying question about autobiography. Um, hi, hi, B, it's Katie. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Katie. Hi. Um, but the, <laughs> I, I've just been, because I, I think a lot of times I've been thinking, like, and I think this also, uh, you know, I, I, kind of how everything is autobiographical and kind of grappling with that. And, you know, I think the, you know, particularly for, and how autobiography is centered on race or gender, or all of these things that kind of are true and also presumed and, um, I, I guess I just wanted to talk about the choice or autonomy of kind of how to be interpreted or not interpreted in our writing. Um, and uh, how much control can we exert over our own autobiographies? Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but. That's actually, I love that question. I think I just want to think, like, I, I don't have an answer to that question. How much control, how much control can we exert over our own autobiography? Is that what you asked? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> I just want to think about that. Um, I agree with Brandon that that's a very difficult question. Um, but I like difficulty, so I'm going to tackle it. Um, and I'm going to tackle by this way. By um, I think it's important 
to misinform people, like about yourself. Like, you know, like where I say, you know, I'm Jewish. And, you know, some people actually believe me, you know. And I, I feel like I don't need to correct them. Like it's not my job to correct them that I'm not Jewish, you know. Um, or that if they, if, if, if one woman, um, I think, approached me and said, you know, uh, after I did a reading and she said, you know, your, your writing is not very good, but your voice is incredible. And, um, and <laughs> I was like, uh, after the reading, I was like, I was like, you know, like you can't correct anyone for the way they perceive or the way that you write something. And, and I, I just thank her. And, <laughs> you know, there's nothing you can do but thank that person, you know, like, oh, thank you. And so, <laughs> and so I think, and it made me realize, and, you know, like it made me smile a lot that day, you know, like I, instead of it feel like an insult, I feel like it both an insult and then a compliment. And so I think like, I think any work that demands that sort of um, response, um, I think that's where it doesn't need to be autocorrect, our old biography. I think it, be it becomes part of that conversation. I think anything that we can turn and re-narrate, turn it into a, something that we can actually um, talk about with other people, I think any autobiography that continue itself, like continue to give birth to itself and continue to um, create different voices and different narratives and different responses, as long as not stagnant or dead, I welcome everything, you know? Um, the thing about stagnation is that it, it leaves a very, um, it's like being in a relationship where one person doesn't communicate ever. And so it doesn't work very well. And a relationship requires one of the fun, found, found foundations of communication, a, a, relation, a good relationship is communication. And so I don't know if that fully tackle your question, but I hope it's at least one fifth there. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do calculus, but I'm not good at it anymore. <laughs> and that it doesn't require calculus, but I feel like it's calculus. Well, I would say that I agree with what you were saying in terms of what looks like an autobiography, not being written or dictated by one person, but this relational blob that's out there and that keeps growing because it really looks different according to different audiences. And it's not like we are these monolithic or easily legible selves. And I think there's an impulse, a good impulse to resist that. And, and so while I don't necessarily engage in overt misinformation, I feel like I do feel, I do feel pulled to fragmentation, to, to trying to refract prismatic notions of the self or to emphasize the performative that I'm different as a sibling than as a teacher, than as a poet. And none, none of these selves are false, even if, they're, even if our everyday lives are filled with these different scripts that may feel like they're misinforming if you look at it from one direction, but they're not, they're all true. And just how to, how, how to make that more apparent, that you're never going to really know me. And, and I think that's good. And, and we keep talking and we keep being in dialogue regardless. And I think as a critic, the role is slightly different from what poets do, which is I think that this question of autobiography is actually very central to thinking about uh, writing by, especially by minority writers, because I don't think autobiography by everyone is treated the same. You know, I think, I think there's always a presumption that ethnic writing is inherently autobiographical and that there isn't much mediation by language or mediation by the imagination. I mean, this is a broad generalization, but it's actually fairly accurate, I think, from what I've seen. So that I think that as a critic, I can at least point out to people that 
their assumption or their presumption about a poem by, say, Marilyn Chen is going to be different from that of a poem by, say, Yeats or, or Eliot or whomever. You know, that there is almost reflexively an idea that a, a poem by an Asian American, say, woman, is that the I in that poem is her. So I get that when I teach because students will read a poem by Marilyn Chin and they'll say, but Marilyn is doing this. And I'm like, Marilyn, what? I mean, this is the, this is the persona or the I in the poem. Why are you with? But they're not going to say that same thing necessarily in a poem by a white man, obviously. So I do think that that question of autobiography is actually very political and it's very racialized. And it doesn't hold across the board for all the reception of all poets. Um, but I think that's changing. I think because of the variety of work and the idea of experimentation and the ways in which one can, what you were saying, Selena, refract things or, or not provide that easy, that easy, the writing that the reader wants, that easy kind of writing. I think that will change things, but I also think that it will take people kind of consciously pointing it out as well. Um, but on that cheerful note, Let's let this in now, and then people can feel free to come up and ask questions, and there are books for sale in the back, and uh, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you.